so that's the Lower Jordan story. The Lower Jordan, a couple things about it before I move on. It is managed. The large woody debris on the river is cleared in order to maintain navigability. I don't believe that it's cleared for a habitat management, from a habitat management standpoint. Large woody debris is actually, is actually managed in other systems around the area, including on the Osavo. So this is a, it's a management tool that can be used. It's, it is used right now on the Jordan River, and it's used in the form of people with chainsaws going and cutting clear paths. On the non-navigable section, so everything once the Jordan River takes a turn, so you can kind of think of about Penny Bridge upstream, it is not managed. Okay? The Middle Jordan is a story about large woody debris and beaver activity. So I drew up this diagram, and I hope that it's helpful. So these here are not meant to be like dead trees. This is just, you know, I couldn't actually draw the full trees, so I kind of chopped them off. <laughs> um, so this was before about 1920, where through disturbance and logging activity and having a previously armored bed, what you had was likely a deeply incised and somewhat cleared channel relative to current day. Obviously it wasn't completely clear. There were still trees. Like I said, the swamp cedar were mostly never logged. At least we don't have any evidence as of our earliest aerial photos that they were, that they were logged. They didn't look like any of the logged portions of the Jordan River. In this system, there was little sand in there. That's what we hypothesized. This, we don't know for sure. Vegetatively anchored banks and a relatively uniform channel depth as compared to an intermediate situation, which by about 1960, most of the banks had really regrown fully. So the swamp cedar had filled in with a bunch of other species, and some of these trees you know, fall in the water, and then you get little ones forming that are maybe a different species. So you get, you get a little bit more complex riparian wooded wetland, and you get some buildup of large woody debris. The large woody, woody debris in addition to the fact that the system is now moving sand, because it's been disturbed, starts to accumulate this sand around it. And as it accumulates sand, and as you have this debris in the river displacing water, the, the level of the water rises somewhat. So you have areas that are significantly shallower than the, than the, the pre-build-up condition, but areas that are also deeper. So you get a, a more complex habitat environment, where you have deep areas and shallow areas. And the, the large woody debris plays a, plays a big role in this. The system is moving sand, and this is trapping it. And other areas haven't been filled in, or they still have high enough velocity due to the various hydraulic conditions in the river to move that sand along and scour it out. Now, if you don't do anything about your woody debris, and you just let it build up, and the beavers can help in this, you can get a very complex channel. And if you look, just look out Penny Bridge, or just walk up, or drive up Jordan River Road, and look at the river, what you see is an incredibly complex interweaving mixture of logs, okay? And you see them in areas that are like sort of recently scoured out. You see older ones, deeper ones further down. So there's just these, they're woven on top of each other. And I, I tried to draw that somewhat here. So this, this woody debris results in, the, results in these pools that could form when you had a limited amount of it in the channel, which is what you see in the lower Jordan, where you see a very complex uh, sedim sedimentation environment. You now, essentially, all of that, all of the, the, the deep parts now are filled in by sand accumulating around all of these intertwined pieces of woody debris. And in addition, you filled up your channel so much with sand, but you're still anchored on your banks, that the river had to find another path. And so you form what was, and I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying the state of it, the, the river up there has, back to our earliest aerial photos, has been a complex channel. But you form what, what, what's a, a braided channel, we sometimes call it anastomosis, it's a neat word, but, um, which means that you have these little islands and you have flow, and these, these rivers, I mean, they're, they're very complex. And you see them right at Penny Bridge. Part of the, part of the Penny Bridge thing is because there's, a, there's an engineered structure there, but... So if you walk to Penny Bridge, there's a, a river running along the road, and that's part of the Jordan River that had cut one of these back channels because it couldn't just widen its banks because it was vegetatively anchored. So, as a result, shallow channels, few, pool, few pools. And so what you see is a fairly uniform depth again this time. And there are still some pools out there, don't get me wrong, but, um, but very few of them compared to what you see in the, the lower section. Um, and we see evidence for this in aerial photos. Um, in particular, this last one's a little bit hard to see here. 
but this is an island in the channel, and I don't know the exact location of this, Brianna pulled it up. But this island has just splits flow, and there's one little tiny piece of an island right there, but it's, it's not significant. It develops by 1993, and by 2010 you have actually two islands, and you'll, you'll just have to take my word for that. So, over the space of 40 years, you've gone from having a relatively simple flow around this one island to having now one, two, three separate channels. And, and you know, there's actually a little island that formed downstream here that may or may not have been present early on. So, um, so what happens with the buildup of the woody debris is you get increasing channel complexity, you get longer flow, path, flow paths, the water slows down, and it drops its sand because its competence has been, has been decreased. And we see another, in, in this example here, this one is actually helped by a beaver dam in the modern era. Um, but the, the channel complexity in this area upstream of this beaver dam has increased greatly since 1963. One other thing that we haven't, um, we haven't done yet, and we would like to do in a continuing study, is we'd like to take a section of this and, and take core, take um, incremental core is what they're called, right, of the, the, uh, the down debris, and actually date the rings in those and, and develop an overlapping time series so we can see, well, when did, this, when did this tree actually fall in the channel? And try and build up support for this idea that initially we had, you know, that we've got these much older trees now that, that have younger trees on top. Well, obviously, they have younger trees on top of them. But kind of get an idea on the time frame of that. Are we, do we see things that are 500 years old, or are we really just talking about the last 80 or so years? To get an idea of the sort of time frame of this. So, I mean, I'll make a note about this. I mean, this is a, it's a, the Jordan River is like a wild and scenic river, right? So you have, you have potentially competing management criteria. And this is obviously something which, you know, is really, spurs a fun discussion. Well, what, what is your endpoint? When you take your, your riverbed and you dig down two meters, you dig down six or eight feet, you're going to create a local environment where you suddenly drop out a bunch of sand and you create a capacity for the river to carry more. So it has an effect downstream, but it has an effect upstream as well. And I have to admit I'm not an expert on sand traps, but the, the function of these, the function of the large woody debris, or the, the, the uh, impact of them, is that they increase the channel complexity, they trap sediment behind them as, local velo as the vortices that form behind uh, woody debris in the water lose capacity to carry set sand, and they aggrade the river bottom, and they increase the complexity of increasing flow path lengths, which also decreases velocities. So it still carries some sand down and out, but not as much as it otherwise would, and it significantly aggrades and, and builds up its bed. I, I should have defined aggrading as, as being the buildup of the bed, which is what in my, my illustrative diagram in the previous slide. <laughs> All right, so um, I can't remember how I got turned on to this idea of looking at beavers, but um, Maybe the appeal was there all along, I suppose. But anyway, so we were, we were tooling around in the, in the watershed, and we noticed lots and lots of beaver chew. And, and here's just a fun picture uh, from the archives. I think this is a Library of Congress picture. Maybe John provided this one to us. I can't remember. But this is a, a, a person holding a trapped beaver. And um, so beaver trapping was, was, was prevalent throughout uh, the, the whole logging period. So in addition to destroying the habitat of the beaver, or at least severely damaging it, um, the, the trappers that, that human activity brought in decimated the local population until the point where there were essentially none. And, and that, this happened over much of, of, of Michigan. Uh, a very large beaver population was, was nearly extirpated or, or locally uh, made extinct. Um, that is definitely not the case now, though. They are everywhere, and they have these, you know, they chew, they chew logs that are probably uh, 12 inches in diameter, and they bring those down, and I think they can do that in like a night. So um, our first find was an inadvertent one. We were actually, we were interested in, we're trying to, we're just looking at this complex channel. We, we thought about this middle channel for a good two years, once I got on the project. Why does it look unlike the channels that you see anywhere else in Michigan? Why is it so different? And Oh, I forgot one important part of this story. Um, this system doesn't flood. So without flooding, it doesn't have the capacity to push this woody debris out of the way. So it doesn't, it, it can't self-manage. It's just building up and reaching a new state. And quite honestly, I don't know quite what it looked like pri prior to logging. I haven't, I haven't quite gotten to that point yet. But after the channel itself had been, 
had been altered by logging activities and made useful for human use. It was, it looked somewhat similar to this. I'm fairly confident in my 1920 starting point. I don't know what was up here. But here when the, the woody debris starts to fall in, it can't flood and push it out. And that's, that's an important property, again, of the Jordan River. It's stuck in its channel until some exceptional storm comes along. So we happen to be just at the, um, the, the fishery takes its um, input from a, a creek. It's like five tile creek or something, yeah, something like that. And, uh, and so we were just walking along that. We, I think we'd maybe uh, taken a sample and, and we, we walked a little bit back and we looked upstream and there's this big beaver dam. And, and this thing, these are just photos from it. You can see the lodge in the background. This is classic beaver dam. And, and it's a good sized dam. And it's, this was, uh, let's see, so she's holding her hands up just about her waist. It's, it's just under three feet tall from the, the water surface, so that the, the elevation difference is about three feet. So this is a good sized dam on the main channel of the Jordan. And, um, right, so we saw this and we, we got really interested. We said, well, we've seen the beaver chew and we've seen this dam. Like, how much of the complex features of this, of this river system up here are due to the beaver? And so the more we looked, the more we found. We found here, um, this is a dam on an abandoned beaver meadow that's a little bit further downstream on the other side of the road. This is on a tributary, um, making a little bit of sense out of these. This photo here is a photo looking at upstream of the, the dam. This is the, the dam that's partially failed. It's, the water's flowing under it, but you'll notice the dam is still in intact. That means that this is a, a relatively recently abandoned, what's called a beaver meadow, because this is mostly filled in. This is one of, of many of a set of complex pathways through this beaver meadow that the, that the water takes. The sand is mostly, well sand and other, other finer texture, etc., but not a lot, has filled it up. But these snags here, these dead trees, are, they still have their very smallest twigs. So these are probably, this has probably been abandoned sometime within the last five years. Um, the, the trees were killed earlier, but the abandonment, because this is still intact and, it, and the, the twigs that formed it looked relatively modern, this is, we we're guessing this is about five years of, or less of abandonment. But the cool thing was immediately downstream, like just on the other side of the dam, was another beaver meadow. And this beaver meadow was a lot older. This one had snags that had evolved a lot. Um, actually, I don't think that's a picture of the, the downstream one. No, that's the same one. So this one had, had its snags were, were or they were much more simple. They had only their big branches left, none of their little twigs. So this one had been abandoned for quite a period of time. And it only had one channel passing through it. So we, we, we thought about this week. We put together this conceptual model, which is that the beavers build a, a dam. You get sediment accumulation behind the dam. It accumulates somewhat unevenly, and you get this complex channel structure. And this actually does happen, where you get branching and then re, rejoining, because this is flowing so slowly that it doesn't, it doesn't have the, the energy to evolve a, a simple channel. And then water, this is mostly intact, it, it underflows the dam because some of the, some of the uh, cement material that they used had, had, had been pushed out. Finally it gets breached, it finds a, one path through. But the, the thing about this dam is that it's not just a dam. I mean, you, you saw that the amount of snags in here, and again, this LWD, our, our large woody debris, is holding this sediment in place. So you're holding the sediment in place, you don't have the ability to flood, and what that means is the beaver a beaver dam in the, in the Jordan River is a force of aggrading the river. It builds it up. And it builds it up by more or less what the level of that dam is, minus a few feet. Because the, the beavers actually, the beavers abandon their dams as soon as they, as soon as like the foxes can walk through the water. They're no longer useful to them. So, they serve a little bit different function. In other places, beaver dams get breached and they cause, they send flood waves downstream and, and all these things. And in the Jordan River, they probably didn't. So we thought, well, how extensive are these things? And what we did, or what Brianna did actually, was we mapped all of the beaver activity that we could see in aerial photographs and satellite images back to 1938. So here's an example of there's nothing on this channel in 1938. In 1955, a dam forms, and again, I'm apologizing, you'll probably have to take my word for it. But the river here gets wide, and then it gets small again, and there's a few small channels flowing out of the dam. That's a really characteristic signature. 1999, it's there, but it's actually moved downstream. This dam is right here, and it's moved downstream. And this is one family, one, one not really family, but one community unit of beavers says, well, this one's not useful, I'm just going to go right downstream because there's, I've still got all my tasty aspen to eat. <laughs> and then 
they, they still were occupying that same site in 1999. So we have an idea that they use these sites for something on the order of decades, and then they abandon them, and then it takes several decades for those to, to evolve to the point where they're more or less just a channel again. But they've got all of this large woody debris that's now buried in the sediment. It's not, it's not something that was just in place by the glaciers, and it's just sand. It's just, this is sand and, and somewhat finer stuff mixed in with a bunch of uh, woody debris. And here, she actually mapped all these out. She drew polygons around the dams. And the cool thing is, well, we have a lot of data here, actually. So we have, from 1938, we have, uh, what's that, four, eight, we have ten different times where, where Brianna has gone and counted the number of beaver dams and actually digitized or drawn outlines around the dam ponds. And she had to get a bunch of these images from the MSU's aerial imagery archive and scan them. And then, so she just had a scanned picture and some rough idea of where it went. And so she had to take it into a, a geographic information system and put it on and twist it and adjust it so that it fit right. So here's probably 60 images, yeah, maybe fewer than that, maybe 40 images that have all been overlaid and matched up so that she could go in and count the beavers, the beavers and, and identify the dams. And this is, uh, what year did you say that one was in? Uh, 1955. 55. So then we said, okay, well, we've seen these. We saw some of them on the ground. We saw them in, in Google Earth, and we, we saw them in our air light imagery. Let's go make sure we're getting it right. So we picked out a whole bunch of sites. We're here in July, and she and another student, uh, Ryan, went and they identified on the ground. This is called ground truthing. Went and identified all of these sites, and sure enough, every single one that had been identified as a beaver feature was indeed a beaver feature. So these have, have very high positive identifications, which is good for us because that means we don't actually have to, to go to every single one. And we thought, well, let's, let's take some sediment core. Let's see what the, the beaver dam looks like, what, what it's trapped behind it. So here's Ryan working with a hand auger. And he starts down. And you can see about what he's, he's sunk in the ground here. He sunk about, uh, actually, I think we have a precise number of 1.27 meters, so right around 4 feet of sediment. And this is a good-sized beaver dam. Its level had been lowered due to a partial breach. And this is muck and mud, but it's very sandy with just a little bit of finer grain stuff. And further upstream of the dam, the, the mucky sediments were about 0.87, so they're about 2.2 feet, 2.3 feet. Yeah, a little bit more than that, two, two and a half. So, okay, I'll, I'll, those, I'll mention those numbers a little bit later. So, 1938, there were two dams in the entire Jordan River Valley. By 1952, that was up to 13. Stable to 1963, 1973 we're back down. Not sure what caused the, the drop in beaver populations. I don't know, maybe it was a disease. Uh, back up around 1980, a boom to, to 27, then to 40 in 1993. A spike in 98, 99 that's probably due to not necessarily misidentification, but this happened to the, the satellite. This was 1998, right? Yeah, the satellite happened to fly over within like a one day span that the Jordan River was near a flood level. So it captured a very high water level, and so what were maybe not necessarily active features, but were sort of still there on the landscape and got partially flooded again, were, were essentially misidentified. So that's sort of a spurious point, or, or an outlier. Then we're back down to 27 in 2005, 30 in 2006, and 42 now in 2010, which, I mean, this is hot off the press, and she did this last night at night. So, what, what it looks like is we have a stable population of something around 35 dams active in the Jordan River Valley at any given point. And you'll notice, um, I'm going to go a little bit back, you notice they're not just up in the, the forest, I mean these, these are up in people's backyards. So, um, beaver and, and, and people can, can obviously conflict. So the total area flooded by the dam, so I told you she went and she drew all the polygons, so this is in acres. We're going from 1.6 acres flooded to around 55 acres flooded at its peak. Um, this was probably that spurious peak, though. And so we'll look more at, at sort of the 40 acres are flooded. So if we assume conservatively that the dams can trap around 1 to 2 feet of sediment on average before they fill up, then the active dam population, around 30 dams or 40 total acres, can, can account for about 100,000 cubic yards of sediment that are held back. And this is pretty significant. If the Jordan River is exporting something like 50,000 every couple of decades, these guys are doing a lot of sediment trapping. And not, a lot, not all of it, some of it, will, will be re-released because once the dam fails, some of that will be cut back in. 
But because it's now partially held in by woody debris, and it's got all sorts of rich sediment that would be great for new trees to form, these areas tend to uh, keep their sand for quite a, or their sediment for quite a long period of time. So this isn't like 100,000 cubic yards a year. I actually I don't know for sure what the turnover rate is, is, is on these things. If you assume it's something like every 20 years, then you can get a rate of trapping. But nevertheless, there's a lot of capacity in the system that these beavers are, are actually tapping. So before we go on, so we've got the coarse woody debris, which the beavers are a big part of. I mean, these guys, they're, they're crazy. I mean, some of the things that they, they drop to the ground, there's just no point to it. It doesn't, it's not close enough to the, the water, so they, it was just like a midnight snack for them, and then they've moved on. Um, they drop things all over every which way and, and, build, and help to build what's a very complex large woody debris environment in the middle channel. So, so the, this, this large woody debris environment serves as, as a, a, a sediment trap. It reduces the amount of sediment, sand sediment that the, the middle <coughs> watershed, the middle portion of the Jordan River is exporting down to the lower portion. And as a result, the, the lower portion has quite a bit of what are fairly gravelly areas. Now there's places like Old State Road, I mean, they're just, they're just sand. Um, but there are a lot of areas, and, and I wish I had been able to get together this profile of depth to show that there's a very complex habitat environment in the lower Jordan. And that is probably aided in part by what is a set of, of natural and, and, and human and, and um, Bavarian actors.